Well, thank you guys for joining me. Let's get this audio check out the way. Make sure that my audio should be fixed and adjusted just a little bit to where I don't have to yell. And you should be able to hear me pretty good. Thank you, Vicky. Hops, Delta Dom, well, you guys are fast, fast. All right. <clears throat> Good. Audio check is done. So, this is not the typical Archaics presentation. As a matter of fact, the side of me that you're going to see in this two, two and a half hours is not a side that I reveal very often. Yes, it comes out because it's my true nature, but I'm not a, I'm wearing this shirt for a reason. And I've often, I've often told you guys to pay attention. It's not, it's not some, how somebody looks. It's not even how they talk it has nothing to do with, with even personal beliefs to an extent, but we have to judge things by their effects. If someone's doing the work, does it matter what they call themselves? We live in a material, a materialist medium. At least it's a perceived reality. So we have so many people that are on board with interpreting everything in this material, materialist reality in the physical. But this is completely antithetical to the concept of scripture. A lot of Christians get triggered by my work. I think I'm attacking the integrity of Scripture. And, and in, in a sense, I guess I am. But I'm not attacking the spirit. I'm not attacking the oversoul. I'm not attacking God. I'm attacking the belief that what we have today as the Bible is anything like it was when it was originally composed over 2,000 year period to become what it is today. I'm going to show you some guys from, I'm going to show you guys some things from the scriptures are very, very compelling. And, uh, you know, it, it is of my habit to wait until we got at least a thousand people in the chat. So I'm going to do that. It should be really, really quick before I begin this presentation. But, um, <clears throat> the, uh, Almost every story of Jesus literally screams out to us to interpret this by a different method than the material. There's almost nothing that he did for physicality. It was all very spiritual, to be interpreted spiritually. This is my problem with modern, modern carnalized Christianity. It is the belief, the belief that we could, we could somehow attach the ancient Bronze Age institution of human sacrifice, the ancient Semitic belief in the scapegoat, and put these and inject them into a beautifully spiritual story where they never initially belonged. This is what has happened. And people get triggered over and over when they come into contact with information they cannot overturn. My Dark Scriptures playlist is really compelling. For those who want to understand, we are spiritually divine immortals in a falsified construct. So why do you think anything in this falsified reality can physically do anything to perpetuate the saving of an immortal within? It doesn't even make sense. We're told, we're told that the construct is overseen by the God of this world. In the Gnosis, the Yaldabaoth, the Demiurge. New Testament even call, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 4.4 4 or 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Satan is the god of this world. He's the god of this construct. He's not the god of the cosmos. He's the adversary. This is, this is what's been passed down. I'm not promoting this. This is what's been passed down to us. So we're going to go very deep. In this presentation, I'm going to show you how I put together these spiritual things, these, these gems, these Easter eggs that we find in the Bible. I'm going to be using a, a very unique Bible. It's got brass fittings and locks on it. It's right here. It's a huge Bible. Um, it's from 1872. 
and uh, it was originally published in 1872. It was republished in 1881. This Bible here is a, it has dual columns on the page. It, it's, it shows the, the King James 1611 version print, how it read, and then how scholars have had, had done better work after that. And it shows the new 1681 uh, uh, version of the same thing, King James version, but it's just a better translation. Um, so we're going to be looking at that here in a minute. I'm going to show you some things that are very compelling. But before that, I just added an email in the description box. You guys can check it out. It's addressed to three groups. My moderators, you with blue wrenches, Archaics members, those who support the channel monthly, and, and you have the membership badges, and any anybody who is subscribed to Archaics TV. Now, uh, any one of these three groups, we will verify identities before we mail the packages out. But this is absolutely free to you, and it's 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 just there's no reason I this this library can't contain all the books that I have, and I have multiple copies of many books from the 1800s. Um, of course, I've kept I've kept the cleanest and best copies for this library, so we can PDF them because we're going to be providing uh, the entire Archaics Library PDF for free. Anybody can download all the over 1,000 books you see around me right now. But I have boxes and boxes of other books, nonfiction from different historical time periods that will also be giving away free to moderators, to members, and to Archaics TV subs as our way of giving back to the community. And um, because all these treasures shouldn't be in one place. I only need what I need to, pr to produce the material in the free PDFs. Other than that, I don't need to hold on to boxes and boxes that are stacking up in storage now. So I also have uh, uh, many fiction books. I'm talking about poetry, Charles Dickens, Jules Verne, uh, Mark Twain. I have originals. Uh, I do not value fiction. Um, so it's not, it's not, anything I feel compelled to hold on to. So we're going to be doing raffles. I have, you've seen in my Archaics meetups, I have that gold gold plate uh, raffle machine. I'll be using that live in videos. You'll see me and somebody else. We'll do the raffles live in videos. And these will be the next people getting the next series of packages out. And we'll be mailing these out. And it'll help me to clear up a lot of space. Get uh, I don't need all these fiction. I have a huge collection of fiction. Uh, very classic fiction, but I know everybody would like to have at least one or two books from the 1800s in their in their collections, a showpiece on a mantle or something. And uh, so I'm giving you this opportunity. It's free to you. It helps me out, clear out my material. I don't like to get con I don't like to get congested with so much material that bogs me down that I forget and I lose track of what I have and what I'm trying to reveal, as opposed to what's just in my way. So uh, I got that I got that announcement out the way. Okay, we got over a thousand people in the chat. Another another announcement is uh I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you guys. I'm all uh, I, I did the cliff high critique. Not it was, like I told you, it wasn't personal. I'm attacking the information. But it, it opened up a door for me that that I'm not comfortable with. Uh it for about three days. I sojourned through YouTube channels. I've been to all the ancient aliens channels I could find. I've been to all these alternative, these mystic. Uh, I have visited so many channels and I've been looking, taking sound bites and clips and, and I'm overwhelmed. And, and I, I, I see very quickly how I could lose track of my momentum, how I could get off balance by this. I'm still going to do critiques but I'm going to be very discriminating. I'm going to be attacking concepts instead of just singling people out. Um, I will name those people when I talk about those concepts, but I did not realize because I'm very sheltered. I'm so focused on, on just keeping my nose in these old books and telling you guys what I find and drawing charts. I'm so focused that sometimes I'm really... I'm really naive about 
what's what's being promoted all across these platforms. I've been all over Twitter recently. I've been all over Reddit. I've been all over YouTube. Guys, I had no idea how infected the community is. I don't even want to call it truth or community. I'm done. I'm done calling it truth or community. I am, I am disgusted, not just with the people that are presenting you unverifiable material, how they're presenting it, but I'm disgusted that so many hundreds of thousands of people fall for this. One single video about ancient aliens gets up and there's 300,000 views and the comment sections are packed with people that are just buying into this paradigm, which has zero evidence to support it. And I see this and I realize that, wow, this is not a reflection on the individuals who are pushing out this material. Grifters are everywhere. They just find what the easy the easiest scheme by which they they can perpetuate in order to fill up their bank accounts or whatever they're trying to do in life. I had no idea until the last three days. I'm literally overwhelmed with the amount of disinformation that is across every single platform. The things that I have heard, it it it, it it's almost shocking, but it's almost taken my focus off of the individuals perpetuating these lies from from the patriot pacification program to the alternative forms of christianity uh, the 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 weird weird versions of christianity it's guys it's not it's a reflection on where we're at today i tell you all the time we're not here to save the world and what i found in the last 3 days in my excursions is absolute proof to me that we're not here to save the world there is no saving this it is infected beyond repair i do i am not buying into the paradigm and the belief that we are entering into a golden age where things are going to be all right and, and enough people get on board we're not we're in a construct it is a programmed repeat and it's been going on for a very long period of time. And we've passed through this construct multiple times to reach this point where we're at now, to be the errant, to be the individual who's going their own way because they no longer buy into the perpet perpetuity programming. They no longer buy into all the different versions of absolutely beautiful and enticing dungeon programming that's out there. What people are investing their faith in is sickening. And there's just no way to really attack the the particulars. I'm going to ha have to stick to the overall concepts and then name all those individuals I find who are promoting that concept. So my strategy is going to change, not, not my scheme. I'm still going to continue with my call outs. I'm just going to be doing it very differently and more discriminating and probably with kid gloves because I see that we're not. Be thankful that you're in archaics. Be thankful that you found, like Jean Nolan of Inspired, that you found. Be thankful you found Campbell of Autodidactic. You know, be thankful that you found Martin Leakey. That's my buddy there. Be thankful that you found some of these, some of these, you know, these channels. Logan Jason, Decode Your Reality. So what if their channels aren't just exploding and thriving? Would they be? in such an absolute apparatus of deceit that we have find ourselves in now. It's uh it's crazy. That's what's been on my mind. It's been on my mind been on my mind since I've just be I've become overwhelmed with the entire world has fallen. This entire world has fallen. Past tense. I'm not I'm not yeah it's it's crazy. It's just crazy. So, <clears throat> before I, I get deep, deep into this presentation, let me remind you of a story. I'm going to remind you of a story right now. Do you remember the story? Now, as you'll see, a lot of people new to my channel have no idea that I've spent 40 years of my life. I mean, I was before I was 10 years old, I was already deep in the Bible. I spent up to my, my 40th year, you know, washed in the blood of the lamb, twice baptized, uh, believing, believing I was walking, you know, in the spirit. And I believe the integrity of the historical word. And I took it literally. And only after I turned 40, did I start applying 
actual true spirituality to the interpretations of the text and and it opened everything up for me and i understood exactly this type of this type of medium that we're in in the words of jesus now absolutely makes sense where before they were enigmatic and mysterious and veiled and i had to i had to rely on biblical commentaries and lexicons and i had to go in deeper and and, and read books that were published by people who claimed to understand uh, uh the bible and this didn't make sense to me. But when I passed that spiritual threshold and I left behind the physicality of this world and I had determined for myself that there's nothing, there's nothing actually real about this Bible outside what it teaches. The dressing by, by which it constructs these teachings is never the focus. It's the background. And the more and more... I came into contact with people like Charles Waite. I have his book back here. Charles Waite, the first 200 years of the Christian religion, it opened my mind. I was like, wow, original Christianity was all spiritual. It was the gnosis. They understood. They understood exactly that what Jesus said was the word of God. Where Jesus walked and what somebody said he did and all that had nothing to do with it nothing it was all dressing it was all part of the construct trying trying to corral spirit into into a certain way to be interpreted i'm going to explain it to you in this video you're going to see it in this video what i'm talking about this is a let me give you an example I, let, let me give you one one good example of how you interpret scripture i'm going to tell you First of all, just like Jesus' parables, which were all fictions, this story isn't true either, but it doesn't need to be. We live in the photo negative of a real reality and everything perpetuated here is false, but we find great value in a lot of these falsities because it leads us to the truth. Every parable was an image of truth. It wasn't the exact truth. Each parable was a story designed to spiritually open our eyes into a greater reality and a, and a deeper understanding uh, of where we fit in this medium. Because it's all about our relationship with source. I call source the oversoul. So, you remember the story about the Pharisees, maybe even some Sadducees, but the Pharisees, had brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. There's many elements to this story that are not that are not they're not obvious in the text. But they become obvious when you look at it from a 360 point of view using other scripture what well, what the scriptures actually say because remember it's a very spiritual text in its self-referencing just like I've showed you in hundreds of examples. The events of world history are constructed. They didn't actually happen. They're self-referencing. How do we know? Because they're arranged in palindromes, cross calendrical parallels that defy coincidence. Real, natural events would have never unfolded in this way. Where's the template? It's the Great Pyramid of the Great Pyramid of Giza. You see it perfectly. I've showed so many charts. Where the calendars and time and, and just different major world events and world history are all encoded right there in the rectilinear measurements of the Great Pyramid. And I'm not talking about the interpretations of David Davidson or Adam Rutherford or John Taylor or H. Alder Smith. No, I'm not talking about Charles P. Izzy Smith, astronomer royal for Scotland. They all knew what I know that the pyramid was a calendar in stone all the way to the apocalypse. But they couldn't show it for two reasons. One, most of them bought into the Usher chronology, which is 134 years off. And the other reason is, is these men never employ, well, uh, engineer David Davidson did, but he was 1926. But all these other men and many more that I haven't mentioned, they didn't have the accurate scientific measurements of the Great Pyramid to the thousandth of an inch that were done by Sir Flinders Petrie. I have those measurements and I have shown you guys on my channel how they all align to the calendars of the ancient world. And they show the year 2040, the year 2046, the year 2052, the year 2070, the year 2106 is the return of the chief cornerstone and then the collapse of the holography itself to reboot into a back all the way back to Genesis in the year 2178. 
So these are the, these are, I have a whole playlist dedicated just to showing these things. But throughout the scripture, it too is self-referencing, just like that research. Let me explain. The Pharisees bring this woman. She's caught in adultery, but it's hypocritical from the beginning. The scripture doesn't say that the Pharisees, who were the judges of the law, were being hypocrites. But you know they were because under the law that they tried to trap Jesus in, they had to bring the man and the woman who were caught in adultery. But they didn't. They didn't bring the man. They just brought the woman, the easy victim. They dragged her before Jesus because they wanted to trap him. It was going, it was going to be a municipal trap that could have gotten Jesus in a lot of trouble if he would have said the wrong thing. The Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and they asked Jesus, you're a master of the law. What say you in the laws of Moses? Shall we do as Moses commanded? And shall we pick up stones and kill this woman for being caught in adultery? Jesus was a genius. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't use the defense of, you didn't bring the man. Where's the man? He could have done that. And an ordinary person of average intelligence would have done that. Why'd you just bring her? The law says you got to bring the man too. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus didn't speak. When they asked him, should we obey the law of Moses and stone her with stones? Or should we let her go? If he said, let her go, he would be defiant. He would be in defiance of, of the law. If he said stone her with the law of Moses, Jesus would be, would be admitting that, that the law of Moses basically condoned the killing of this woman. They were still under the law. Jesus didn't do either. Instead, he remained silent, kneeled down, and with a finger, he began drawing. He began, well, scripture says he was writing in the sand in the dirt. So after, after they asked him again, Jesus continued writing in the dirt when he basically said, he that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So he convicted their hearts and, and from oldest to youngest, the Pharisees in ones and twos just started walking away and leaving. But scripture is way deeper than that. The story is much more compelling when you understand you have to use scripture to interpret scripture. It, it was spiritually put together. No matter how many forgeries, how many interpolations, how many things that have been altered and changed, the fundaments are always there because the oversoul was going to make sure that despite the corruptions, the spiritual food remains intact. When Jesus was writing in the sand, if you the only place that we can find in the Bible what could have possibly been transpiring is in the book of the prophet Jeremiah. I'm going to read it for you. Matter of fact, I'm not going to read it. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you. Let's see. Let's get, let's get back on this. You still your present. Share screen. Share screen, entire screen. All right. Hey, I'm getting I'm getting pretty good at this, guys. Getting pretty good at it. There it is. Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Now, what does this mean to me? It means that when the Pharisees approached Jesus with the woman and he knelt down, he was writing their names in the sand. And this is what compelled them to walk away. The Pharisees know the, the books of the prophets. They knew the law. And when they saw their own names being written in the sand by a silent Jesus, they understood the implication. The, here it is right here. The wicked are written in the earth. 
So it's many examples like this that we could use. We could go through the entire, almost every single thing Jesus did. And we can take what is going on in the text and we can find we can find a correlate somewhere that gives us additional information as to what was transpiring. <clears throat> Jesus was writing their names in the sand and it scared the hell out of them. And they were no longer worried about that woman that they were they were trying to trap uh, Jesus in the law. The trap was sophisticated. This wasn't simple, guys. You have to understand. They wanted Jesus to, to say yes in the law of Moses she must be stoned. The reason was, was because the Jews could not, could not uh, carry that out without going to, to the local municipality. This is one thing Christians have, have Christians have a lot of problems with. I've, I've tried to bring it to their attention. Academics and academics and scholars have mentioned this in, in many of their, of their researches and books. Under Roman law, these were epic administrators. Under Roman law, it would have been absolutely impossible to condemn Jesus to death and then within three days execute him or condemn Jesus to death in the next day or, or within a three-day period. It, it's impossible because under Roman law, a death sentence mandated that the local governor, Pontius Pilate, would, would have to dispatch a message by ship to Rome then, then there were subordinates in the Roman Senate that would give it to the proper authorities. It may not make it to a senator, but it would make it to somebody in Rome who would either yay or nay that execution. In Roman, Roman, provincial, Roman provincial territories, governors did not have the right to kill, kill the citizens of that province. It had to be approved by Rome. So the Pharisees knew this. And if Jesus would have condoned her stoning, and if the people listening who really idolized Jesus were following suddenly picked up stones and killed that woman, the Pharisees would have dispatched all kinds of messages to the local Roman authorities to have Jesus arrested because he initiated the murder of a woman. It was a really sophisticated trap. So... <clears throat> All right, so let's go with, uh, I just wanted to show that to you. The wicked are written in the earth. That's why Jesus was writing. That's why he was doing that. Now, I'm, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to show you one more verse right here on my screen. I'm going to show you multiple ones, but this one right here before I go on this, when I open up this old ancient Bible over here, let me, uh, share this one. Okay. All right. Let's go right here. Y'all hold on. Somebody just somebody just appeared at my door and this dog's not gonna be quiet. Let me uh let me grab this real quick. All right. I didn't know we had a visitor coming. So here it is. Most of you have read this by now, but it's very important because this completely outlines exactly how the scriptures are to be interpreted. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father over soul, source in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This is a key scripture that should open up the eyes of the individual who really wants to decode the messages that are all, all the Easter eggs throughout scripture. If you come, if you if you employ a literal interpretation to the New Testament then you're going to be restricted by all, all the rules that govern this, this physical perceived reality. You're going to be trapped into a box. That's what you're going to do. But when you understand that what's being conveyed is spiritual, and it is not, not anything to do with the physical world, 
you're going to have some mind explosions. So I'm going to, I'm going to show you some mind explosions today because we're going to be dealing with the whole armor of God. What it means, how we, use, how we use it, why it's necessary. We're only focusing on the book of Ephesians. This is where it is found. However, before we even start on what I'm going to show you, what was written by Paul or Apollonius in the book of Ephesians, I'm first going to read to you straight out of the Christian mysteries in the first chapters of the book of Revelation. Because the very first of the seven churches was Ephesus, and it's for good reason. Remember, it's a fundamental tenet of Scripture that the first shall become last, and the last shall become first. Over and over, we are, we are, we are told that the Word appeared, and this is the Logos. It is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The Revelation record, I've told you many times in many presentations, the record, Revelation record is very enigmatic because there's only one book in the entire Bible that employs the same iconography, images, and even syntax, and it is the book of Genesis. The alpha text of the Bible can be used to decode much of the omega text. But when you do that, you find that the Revelation record isn't necessarily a book about the future. It's a book about what already happened. And when you, and when you interpret it that way, you find that Genesis isn't describing a past. It's describing a future that was a part of multiple pasts. This is all reset theory, guys. Remember. Remember, the beginning of Genesis, the whole creation story, isn't even a creation story. It's a renovation of a world that has been previously destroyed. Got to read Albert T. Clay. Matter of fact, you guys got that coming. You got it coming. Oh, here's a, here's a, here's a Smith Palmer. You guys got this one coming, too. I need to stop sharing my screen. So you can stop screen share. You guys got this coming real soon. That goes into these details about Genesis. That scholars, even in the 1910s and 20s, were absolutely convinced that the book of Genesis was describing an ancient cataclysm and how humanity, the survivors, had continued and started in the pre-flood world. And before the pre-flood world, there's a totally different world here, but it was destroyed. It's all here. This is from 1923. We'll be getting into Albert T. Clay, and we'll be getting into uh, uh, Smith, A. Smith Palmer. that goes into these details. They go, they go real deep. These are old books, but they got bibliographies, all kinds of notes. These are awesome. You got you guys got this coming pretty quick. It was on my list of videos for January that I had provided. So I'm going to drink this coffee. get over here real quick get my out of my chair all right i don't even know if i got enough i don't even know if i got enough room it's got big brass fittings on it where you can lock it i don't even know if i got enough room on on my uh on my desk here Back. Way in the back. Already, I already, I'd already marked it. All right, let's see here. Old book. All right, I'm gonna see if I can lay it here without messing up my computer. All right. Also, even these giant Bibles. They're just, my God, they still got, they still got all kinds of, oh, uh, so, the crew, 
Many elements of the Christian mysteries are in the first chapters of Revelation. I'm going to read. I'm paraphrasing. I'm going to read whole sections, and I'm going to paraphrase others. But we're, we're, we need to do this before we go into the the secrets of the book of Ephesus, um, the book of Ephesians. So, all right. Get some more coffee real quick. Some of the books I have, guys, some of these books, you're not going to believe how small the print is. Micro print, published in 1823. Some, some of them published in the 1850s. Micro print, so small. 700 page books, it blow your mind. Even reading glasses don't help. It's crazy. All right. The book of Revelation, chapter one, verse eight. This is not a Bible study, but then again, it is. It is, because this is necessary before I get to the book of Ephesus. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. All right. I'm only reading from the 1611 authorized King, Jer King James Version text. This, this other text is uh, 1881. This, uh, this is a comparative Bible. The, the column on the left is 1611. The column on the right is 270 years later. It's 1881. So, verse 11, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia. This is Asia Minor. The very first church mentioned of the seven churches that all the letters of Paul were addressed to is Ephesus. Ephesus is the first. Then Smyrna, then Pergamum, where he says Satan's seat is. Then Thyatira and Sardis in Philadelphia and Laodicea. We're not going to get into a lot of these. But the first shall become last and the last shall be first. Ephesus is mentioned first. And they're straight, and, they're, and we're going to read what he says to, to the, the Ephesians. But the promises of all are granted even to the one. What I mean is, is there are seven churches. There are seven different types of, of, of basically, basically church organizations. However, they were all Greek. Every single one of them is a Greek city. Now, some of these were Western Greek, like Athens, stuff in that area. But most of them were Ionian Greek. What do, what do we know about Ionian? Ionian comes from Io. What is Io? Io was the eponym for Hathor, the cow goddess. For those of you who don't know, in my Chronicon, I show you all the all the all the migration routes of the ancient Israelites when they left Canaan. When they left Canaan, they went to Asia Minor first, settled Miletus, and from Miletus they began exporting whole fleets out to all the Danan, to the Tuathaday Danan. They just started going all over the world. You know, the Israelites became a mariner race, and uh, um. They basically, they basically fulfilled what the one tribe of Israel that was banished had started, which was the tribe of Dan, a race of mariners. But they had left early on, and they were excluded from the Israelite roster, and they were replaced with someone else. And But uh, anyway, this is uh, the first church of Ephesus. So we move on, and we find that to he who overcomes is said to all the churches, but they're all promised different things. However, by context, any member of one church can actually receive the benefits of all. So, chapter 2 starts off. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith that he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. This is interesting because the seven stars are interpreted earlier before we are introduced to the tetramorph. And it says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The angels are the spirits that protect over that church. Now, the seven candlesticks are said to be the seven churches themselves. That's, the, that's how Revelation interprets itself. Says, I know your works and your labor. Says, Thy, thy works and thy labor. 
and thy patience, and how thou, thou canst not bear them who are evil, and thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, but they are not, and you have found them to be liars, and have borne and have patience, and for my name's sake you have labored and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. This is to the house of Ephesus. The house of Ephesus, remember the first shall become last and the last first. Ephesus is addressed first. Yet, they've already lost their first love. Ephesus, Ephesus here is actually being painted as the last days believers, the believers in the last days, who they are, what they need, what they've done. Last days implies that the seven churches have been going on for a long period of time. The last has become first and the first has become last. Ephesus now takes the role of the end times body of believers. Ephesus, they've lost their first love, meaning, meaning they've, they can discern truth. They know who the liars are. They've, they've awakened to the point that when they know who all the false prophets are, all the false information, and they know that they got it down. But in demon chasing, in recognizing the darkness, they've actually lost their light. I'm guilty of this as well. I get carried, I get carried up with doing exposés and exposing bad data and bad, bad information and outright liars and deceivers that I, that I often forget that I still, I'm still a work in progress too. And I've got to continue to share my light, not just expose darkness. So this is basically what's, what's being told to the believers in the last days. Listen, you're wise. The Spirit has made you wise. You see with clarity. You separate fact from fiction. You got all that. But you need to be careful because you're losing your first love. The first love, what is it? We're going to talk about it from the book of Ephesus. It's the golden rule. It's the golden rule. Simple as that. <clears throat> now, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. It's all metaphor. This is to be spiritually interpreted. Spiritually interpreted, guys. Remember, the book of Genesis begins with being denied the tree of life and, and partaking in the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, for those who overcome, who have already lived through all the life sims of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, to those who overcome in the last days, I will make you partakers of the tree of life. We haven't experienced that before because we're living life sims, steadily dying over and over and over and over to come right back into a construct of good and evil. And the reason for this is because we haven't even received our real avatars. We keep borrowing avatars from the construct. Now, so verse 17, chapter 3, chapter, no, chapter 2. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, save it he that receiveth it. Manna was given to the ancient Israelites to feed them in the desert after they departed the land of Goshen in Egypt, where the Great Pyramid is situated. They left behind that monument, which was built by their Sethite ancestors before the flood. They left that behind and entered into the wilderness, the world. The book of Revelation calls the world Egypt and Sodom. So, and I will give you to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone, a new name written in there. Remember, I've told you from the Shepherd of Hermas text, we see that, that the pyramid structure, each stone is a soul of man. 
And if you are, if you are, if it is determined that you are adequate building materials for the, for the monument of God, then you, then your stone will be incorporated into the structure and you will be given a new name because you will no longer be identified with your old identity. This has everything to do with receiving a new avatar. How do I know this? Because they're about to say it. Now, remember those, those who get the new avatars are those who make it into the monument of man before the descent of the chief cornerstone. And we're going to learn more about that in the book of Ephesus. I mean, I keep saying the book, of, I'm naming the city, uh, book of Ephesians. Chapter 3, verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, avatars. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. We don't have white, gar we don't have white garments right now. So something has changed for these individuals. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. In the Apocrypha, in the book of 2 Esdras, is a passage that describes the Great Pyramid. And it says specifically that Ezra received, received divine information from an angel in the form of 204 books. 204. I've showed you guys that the geometry of the Great Pyramid identifies the number 204 in two different ways. One of them is that the Great Pyramid is 203 courses of blocks that go from the foundation 203 levels all the way up to a, an empty platform. 203. The descent of the chief cornerstone to sit on top of this monument fulfills the 204. How do we know that's accurate? Because the Great Pyramid's slopes, its sloping angles are at precisely 51 degrees. 51 degrees times 4 is 204. So, anyway, let's, let's move on to that. There's all kinds in, 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 the, in the Christian mysteries, there's all kinds of reference to this. Basically, what is being said here is that, is that this structure that is built up of stones, each stone be, being an avatar, a white robe that is given to he who overcometh, this structure is the book of life. The book of life, a book is nothing but a container of, of knowledge. What is being described here is the creation of a new of a new group of beings who have passed through something that allowed them to be a part of a group of overcomers. Their reward is not just to receive new avatars, but these new avatars as a group actually embody the concept whatever that may be of the book of life. I'm not talking about a book like this. We're talking about a container of knowledge. This new avatar is going to allow these overcomers to do things that were never permissible inside the construct. How do we know? I'm about to read more about more, more about going the Christian mysteries are telling you what is being inherited here. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This is a reference. Remember, remember this started with, with the church of Ephesus, which is now transposed to the last days. This is nothing but last days wording here. 
a huge controversy in the last days about who the Jews are. It's right here. And that the overcomers are not among that group. Here's where it gets, it gets amazing, guys. Let's talk about now. I will say this. It says, uh, I will I will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This is very specific prophetic language that in the last days, some type of delusion is going to basically ensnare the entire world. And the only the only souls that are immune to this are those who have been found worthy, whose eyes have been opened because they're already overcomers. They are a part of a group of individuals inside the construct who have already been selected and that their destinies are known. How do we know this? Because I'm going to show it to you in the book of Ephesians. It continues, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And I will write upon the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down upon heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. An avatar that be that belongs in sync with a group of other avatars that have all just inherited divine knowledges. How do we know? It says that these this group will be identified as the Book of Life. The book is a container. But now we get a real clear picture. Scripture is clarifying this concept. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. For those who can't understand that term, that, that phrase, I'm going to explain it to you. In ancient times, when somebody wanted to know the word of God, they didn't look in a scroll and they didn't look in a book. They walked into a temple precinct and they were escorted to the wall texts. The wall texts gave them the histories and the backgrounds of, of the people, the temple, the culture, just different, different, you know, holy stories. But when they were but when they wanted to see the real mysteries they were taken to the pillars there would normally be two pillars protected by an inner sanctum and they were led into there and pillars did two things one they supported the structure from falling down they were they were seen that that's why they were a pillar they were supporting this is why the great pyramid used to be called the pillar of enoch because it was thought by the ancients that the, the Great Pyramid held up the sky. And in a way it did, because it is the container of programming for our entire construct. But in ancient times, people walked into a temple. And when they walked into that temple and they saw those pillars, they were covered in divine writings. And they could read scripture straight off the stones. Pillars have always, look in all your old books, flip through all the encyclopedias and you'll see, pillars in all ancient temples were covered with knowledge. I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God and I will write my name uh, uh, on your raiment. This right here is the receiving of a new avatar. A white robe is symbol of a pure avatar. That it, that it is a part of what is a larger book of life mean, mean, means that it's bestowing rights, privileges, and immunities to the wearer that are not going to be enjoyed by anybody else in creation. This individual will possess divine information. This individual will have their own spiritual name inscribed on their soul. And it will be readable to everyone else in creation, wherever they go. Remember, guys, God is not a singularity. The oversoul is eternal. 
And being eternal, this necessitates that the creation was not an event. The creation is ongoing and it will always need more divine beings to help oversee the creation of new constructs. So, yeah, when you look at when you look at reality from this perspective, kind of makes you wonder who Jesus was. Who was Jesus? Was he one? Was he someone who graduated to he who overcometh while well, give a white stone? Did he become the chief cornerstone of our construct simply because he overcame a prior one? And if that's the case, then who are you? So let's uh share my screen here again. <clears throat> oh, let me finish that passage. Okay, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. At the end of all these psalms, we see Amen. Amen comes from, you know, the Israelites came out of Egypt. Amen was the name of the unseen one, the most ancient of the Egyptian gods, the hidden one. That was the Amen. And here we are. It makes an appearance right here. It makes an appearance right here. It's not the first time that Amen, the hidden one, has made an appearance in Scripture. The book of Revelation is signed off by Amen as well. But Amen also makes an appearance uh, surreptitiously in the New Testament in the writings of Paul. When Paul went to the city of Athens and, and he basically praised the men of Athens for being knowledgeable and the philosophies and all that, and then turned around and condemned them for saying, hey, you have a God for every day of the year here, and yet you know nothing about the one true God. And he pointed to a statue that nobody was paying attention to. And the inscription on the statue was the unknown God. It's Amen. The Greeks had access to the unknown God all along. But they had totally, until, until Apollonius had, had brought it to their attention, they didn't, they didn't know what they had. Let's go. That might be it for my, yeah, that's, that's it. No, it's not. I'm almost done. Okay, that's it. That's it. Almost done. So, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Get that literal crap out of your heads. If there's anything that, that toxifies and poisons the scripture more to modern Christianity is to interpret these things so literally. I'm going to read that again because this is to be interpreted spiritually. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. It's not standing at a door and he's not knocking. If any man hear my voice, you're not going to hear, hear his voice with your ears. And open the door. I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Sup is to feed. And in ancient times, if, if, if you would never sit at a table and eat and eat in the presence of an enemy, it wasn't done. You sat around friends and family and people that you trusted. Poisoning was a very, very real fear all throughout antiquity. I will, these are not, these are not to be taken literally. And most of you know that, but you still have, you still have this vast corpus of souls in this construct who are trying to translate everything literal, except the few pieces that they want to translate into something else in order to justify their crucifixion fiction. That somebody actually, that human sacrifice set up by the adversary, the demi-urge, Ahriman, set this, set this horrendous, public execution, which would totally violated Roman law, never happened. 
We have 10 to 11 different historical authors that were alive during those days, and none of them wrote about the eclipse and the earthquake. And yet, look at, look at the early Christian documents that all appeared a century later. None of them existed at the time. We have no original Christian documents that say any of these things. Even Flavius Josephus is silent on any of these things. There was no eclipse. There was no major earthquake. And all that all of that is a part of the crucifixion event. There, And it would have never happened. It would have taken at least a month to get word back from the Roman Senate to even see if that crucifixion was going to be permitted. It wasn't a common way to kill people. Crucifixion was rare. It was rare and it was used only in rare circumstances. So anyway, I want I want to toot that horn. This is all this is all very spiritual. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne. Even as I have overcame, and I am set down with the Father on his throne. Again, who was Jesus? He said, we can do what he did. We can sit on the same throne he did. We can overcome like he did. There's an admission right here from Jesus that he had overcome something too. What I'm trying to point out is, is that many of the statements that Jesus has said, like, I and my father are one. Many of the things that when he included himself, when people were talking about the Godhead, he wasn't lying. It's to be spiritually interpreted. Those who are wearing that white raiment, who have the name of God and their own personal name on it, are now a part of the Godhead. They are a part of the family of the oversoul. The oversoul is not, it is not a, it is very mundane thinking to think of a, of an angelic or a heavenly hierarchy. That's the world. That's how the world thinks. In the realm of the spirit, there is this vast spiritual equality and the oversoul wants to interact with its own creations. And the best way to do that is to turn them into family. This is the, this is what the Christian mysteries are about interpret them literally and you're going to get all kinds of religiosity like bad like southern baptist doctrine like methodist doctrine like lutheran doctrine like roman catholic doctrine like presbyterian doctrine then you're gonna get some really wild spinoffs like jehovah witnesses and mormonism but when you interpret these things spiritually you see that something beautiful is unfolding most of the world's gonna miss it but we're going to see in the book of Ephesus, we're going to see clearly that are they going to miss it? Because this construct is going to reboot and they're going right back to Genesis to live through all these life sins again. But if this is perpetual programming going on over and over and over and over, then God is not a liar because the scripture says, I would, I would have it that all men be saved. Men just being the general the general for humanity. I would have it that all humanity be saved. Well, if that's the case, and yet we're still dealing with, with ignorance and evil and all that, then that means that this world is doing exactly what the story of Genesis to Revelation shows. Revelation shows the beginning. Genesis actually encodes the end, the end of a prior world. We're on a loop. And every time there's an exodus event, many of these souls exit the construct to join the family of God. And I'm pretty sure the family of God is all about growth. And you're going to the next level, then the next level, then the next level. Because remember, for dealing with an eternal medium, there, there is no way to fix any perimeters on that. Just continue to grow and to grow and to grow. So that was all. Uh, and now. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Chapter five. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals, excuse me. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, 
neither to look thereon. I'm done with this right here. I wanted to I wanted to read that because I wanted to show you guys that in the continuity of the message, after after the Christian mysteries are addressed, it instantly goes into the seven seals. There's no transition. It goes instantly into the seven seals. Why is this important? Because the seven seals were for the last day's believers, the last day's church, to understand the time of the events, what was going on. We know this was written not in Hebrew, guys. It was originally written in Greek. It's Greek syntax. The original biblical manuscripts for the New Testament are all in Greek. The seven churches were all located in Asia Minor, in Greece, in Ionia, which was all Greek. The reason I'm telling you this is because it, it behooves us to interpret all these things from the Greek mindset. That's why we know what the first seal was. We know what the second seal was. Employing only the Greek grammar, Greek syntax, we have a much better picture of what's about to unfold. So that's for another video. We're going into the whole armor of God. But we do have a video coming up on, on the seals real quick. So I'm done with this. I will put it up later. I'm just going to get it out the way. All right. I have not checked my chat feed the entire time. Make sure I haven't been running my mouth for nothing. Everything good? We've had no hiccups? Yeah, it's all Greek to me. All right, cool. Thank you, guys. All right, now. Oh, that was good. And I know it's taking an hour and 10 minutes to get to this point. But all the juicy juicy is coming up. Because the whole, the whole, this whole presentation was leading up to this point. All that was necessary. It's just background information to set, basically to set the tone of what we're going to look at now. So, uh. All right. I want to have to share my screen again. Before we go into it, I got, I got two little meme deals I want to show you. I'm going to share my screen. Some of you have seen these if you've been following me for a while. So let's see where they are. Here they are. I'm getting pretty good at this. All right. You guys should be seeing this. Ancient Hindu text, the Mahabharata. It's about 13th century BC. Do not do to others what you do not like for yourself. Okay. Now we're going to the next one. Ancient Egyptian Magical pap Papyrus. It is in a book titled Lords of the Left Hand Path on page 117. The ancient Egyptian text reads, I am the son of the living God. Showing you those, showing you those things. I'm showing you that. It's not Jason telling you this. There are many, there are many biblical scholars that have isolated whole passages out of ancient Near Eastern and Egyptian texts that show you, even, Hin, even Hindu, Canaanite, Rashamic, Ugaritic, Hittite. There are, the Bible is a soup made of all the best ingredients. And through it, because you gotta understand there's spiritual people in Ugarit. In, in ancient Biblos, in Sidon, in Carthaginia, there were spiritual people. Even in Rome, there were spiritual people. The Bible is an amalgamation of ancient texts, especially from the age of the Amuru, the ancient Amorites. Most of the Old Testament are Amorite texts that were rewritten by Jewish scribes. So spirit, spirit, the, the oversoul is able to use whatever medium it needs to. If the Amuru are in power during the Hyksos reign and, and they're running the courts of Urartu all the way from Hittite Anatolia to, to uh, the kingdom of Mitanni and, and the, the fifth 
the fifth dynasty of Babylon, all Amorite, all Amuru, if they're running the show at that time, then their scribes are being used by the spirit to convey these materials. Yeah, don't buy into the bullshit. The bullshit, it's all bullshit about the Jews are the, are, are the chosen people of God and everybody else is subpar and it's the Jew first and, and, and then the Gentile. No, all of those are inter interpolations that were added to the biblical material centuries after those, those documents first appeared. No, don't buy into that, guys. That's, that's all BS. All the separation of uh, the separation of peoples in, in, into Jew and Goyim, the separation of the peoples in, in, in the New Testament and the corrupted versions of the New Testament that we have today in, in between Jew and, and Gentile, all of that, all of that are recent interpolations. They don't have anything to do with the original concepts, the original, the original text. Yeah, it's crazy, it's crazy, guys, what we have accepted to be true. So anyway. For the Christian mysteries, how the how the how our inheritance is the avatar, the oversoul, how how I even have I even paint a pretty vivid picture in here of what we're going to be doing after we exit the construct. How everything everything in the construct is concerning the Great Pyramid. It, it is the template for all this until the descent of the chief chief cornerstone. Guys, I don't get on my on this channel and plug my books books very often. I, I just don't. But here it is, my very first published book, and it is absolutely packed full of data. It's in small print. A lot, it's got some illustrations. It's got a huge bibliography. But these are the Christian mysteries. They're in here. I cite over a hundred and fifty ancient texts in this book, giving you the business. If that's you, if that's what you're interested in. You need to go to Amazon or go to Booktree, 1-800-700-TREE, and order this from my publisher. Uh, I'm, run, I'm running out of copies. Now, also, as far as, and so as far as borrowing some of these divine abilities, these rights, privileges, and immunities that we have in spirit, before we even exit the construct, as far as utilizing the spiritual basically treasury of abilities that we can, that we can tap into. That's what this book is about. Awaken the immortal within. And the first, the first like 15 pages are probably going to piss you off because that's what it's designed to do. Yeah. This, this, this book is absolutely designed to tick you off in the first pages. If you're really, really clinging to a lot of the belief systems that have contaminated your perception. This is, this is my, my best selling book, small, awaken the immortal within. This is how you tap into those spiritual powers. This is how a guy living out of a backpack on a motorcycle with $27 on his pocket became who, who's talking to you today in just three and a half years of a YouTube channel. Here it is right here. All the principles that are in this book I live by and I'm enjoying it now. So anyway, let's go. <clears throat> Let's move on. We're at one hour and 16 minutes, and now we're going to get into the business. <clears throat> we share my screen. We, 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 we've, we've been doing really good with the audio today, so all oh, that's good. Present, share screen. I'm going to try something a little different here. That's not it. So answer me this. Can you guys still see me? Thank you. I want to see in the chat. Can you guys, if I'm sharing, I opened up a window. I didn't share my whole screen. So I need to know if you guys can still see me. Did I do that right? You can? Okay, you see me off to the side here? Awesome. 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 That's all I need to know. I wasn't sure how that, how that worked. Excellent. So I'll go ahead and make this big so you can see it. 
Ephesians 1.4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. I wanted to draw attention to the very beginning of Ephesians because this statement right here shows that we are far more important than we suppose ourselves to be. Hath chosen us before the foundation of the world. But look, look at the look at the syntax. Hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Guys, I'm trying to convey to you here the Christian mysteries are telling you that that the to he who overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar is something that holds up the temple. What is a temple? The temple is your body. You're told this in the in the Old Testament. I mean, excuse me, you're told this in the New Testament. The temple is the body. We are going to become a part of the body of the creator. And this was decided before we were ever put into the construct. This infers to me, and I know you, some of you are going to have a real problem with this, and it's okay. But it infers to me that the other scriptures that God would have all men saved are absolutely true. They're just not going to get saved at the same time. Some people are so dark and have become so evil that they're going to have to go through this construct multiple times. And in one trip through the construct from Genesis to Revelation, they're going to be living multiple life sins in all different time periods. They're going to have to grow and develop. They may be here a long time before they start maturing and then that maturity grows into something spiritual and then finally they too make their exodus as newer as newer souls have come into the construct ephesians 1 5 predestined us unto the adoption again Here's predestination. This was all forethought before we ever got here. Remember I've told you on my channel multiple times we're in real, no real danger here. None of this is actually real. It doesn't affect the true personality within. We just move on to the next avatar. Now, unto the adoption. This is very important language, guys, because adoption implies blood relation means nothing. Adoption implies that you have been selected despite your race, your pedigree, despite anything that you had no control over when you entered the construct. Adoption infers an entirely different process. Get that shit out of your head that because you're white or because you're black Hebrew Israelite or that you're white, that, that, that you're the descendants of the Israelites and you're, and, you're, and you're gaining all these, that you're Greek. That these, only, these things only apply to you. That's all mundane, worldly thinking, and it it's a complete defiance of the spiritual application of the text. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, God has made known to us the mystery, and it's not by literally interpreting the Bible. It's by the spiritual applications that we can, we can actually get our, our instructions and our answers about reality. The Bible is a supernatural book, but from the beginning of my channel, I've told you guys, the, book, the Bible is a book of good and evil. The Bible is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is what it is from the very beginning. Before Adam and Eve ever sinned, the tree of knowledge of good and evil was already there. And in the creation, we find out it wasn't a creation at all. It was a renovation. Genesis 1-2 is totally separate from Genesis 1-1. It's called gap theory, and it's something a lot of biblical scholars have spent a lot of time on because it infers that the creation wasn't, was not. Well, the beginning in Genesis was not perfect, although all the rest of the Bible says that in the beginning, God made everything perfect. That's not what we find in Genesis. In Genesis, we find everything covered in darkness and destroyed. Then Adam and Eve are introduced and told to replenish the earth. Ephesians 1.10, that in, the, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in all, in one, all things. Here it is. 
pay attention to the language. Dispensation concern, concerns the spiritual ages of the world, ages of the construct. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, the end times. Yeah, the stamped part of the last days belonging to Ephesus, belonging to the Ephesian, the Ephesian night, actually, <clears throat> to he who overcometh. So, uh, again, we have the same language that these people who overcome in the final dispensation are going to be gathered together in one body. Here it is. Together in all things. And remember, it says Christ, but Christ is literally a word that means anointed. Ephesians 1.11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things. What is being inferred here? This has been the stumbling stumbling block for a lot of Christian theologians who are against Calvinism. They're against, they're against predestination, not understanding. And this, the reason is, is because of the materialist interpretation of the Bible. The materialist interpretation of the Bible has has people believing that the Judges 9.27, there is for all men to live once and then the judgment. Okay, that's taken completely out, completely out of context. If I'm living life sims in the construct, my life is not over. All it does is assume a different avatar. The personality continues. I keep moving forward. Remember, guys, reincarnation is real. You may not like you may may not like the fact that we call it transmigration of souls or reincarnation. I believe it's we're just living in life sims. But I but remember, I can never take in information I accept as true and not fit it into my paradigm. The very fact that scientific tests have been done on children who remember intimate details of neighbors, but from the perspective of 80 and 90 year olds, tells me 100% that that soul migrated to that child. There's no way around that. And it makes God's word absolutely viable. I would have all men that they be saved. Okay, that means you're going through this loop many, many, many times if you're not there yet. So here it is right here. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things. Okay, do you really think that God, the oversoul, source, would have ever predestined a certain people to burn in hell eternally? Because if so, then you believe in an unholy God. I don't. I believe that these constructs have been set here for a reason for the growth and maturity. And you're going to be here and you're going to be live through all the life sins necessary required until you finally become he who overcometh. I will give him a white robe. And I can't read your screen because you have it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Let me see this. She just told me that. That's why I'm tech retarded, guys. Y'all can't read my screen. That's terrible. Hold on. So what did I do wrong? I'm sure reading it. All right, let's try this again. We're going to try this again, guys. Show you real quick. So. That screen was wrong, so let me let me try it this way then. I'm going to stop that screen. I'm going to present. Share screen. I'm just going to share the screen. You know what? I don't know if y'all going to be able to see me or not. That window, that window deal just didn't work for me, did it? So what I'm going to do, go straight back into here. So y'all didn't see any of that, huh? That's terrible. That's terrible. I thought y'all could see that. That's upsetting. And there's just no way. Yeah, I just don't. I, I'm just going to take myself off the screen in order to show you guys. It's the only way I can do it. All right. So there's the first one, Ephesians 1.1. 1, 1. 
to the saints which are at Ephesus. Here's the second one I read. Hath, hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Here's the third one. Predestined unto us unto the adoption. Here's the fourth one. Made known un, unto us the mystery. I'm going to catch up to where I was. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in all, in one, all things. Ephesians 1.11 in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things. So, the only way that predestination can happen and God still remain righteous, holy, upright, and perfect is that if the predestination means that all will be saved. No, nowhere is there an inference that you're all going to be saved at the same time. Numbers 9.27 is not violated, for, for, it is, for, it, for it is given unto all men to live once and then the judgment. That's yeah, not violated, because life continues even through, even through all these life sims. I'm not, I'm, not even, I'm not even impressed with that anyway. The book of Hebrews was, was written by the Jews. It was, it was and it's very kind of different than the rest of the, the New Testament. It's an, it's an interpolation anyway. All right. So Ephesians 1:13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that holy spirit of promise. All right guys, we're de we're dealing with something that can't be taken from you. Remember, I've told you guys, once, you, once you're awakened, you can't go back to sleep. It's over with. Something fundamental has changed with your perception of reality. And it may not have been you that did it. But here it is. It's talking about predestination. Now it's talking about sealed. So from the perspective of, from the archaic perspective, we're dealing with a construct where souls are flowing through life sims, but they're not all flowing at the same time together. They're not all maturing at the same time together. This is why life is so full and rich with diversity. Even today, we can walk through our neighborhood and we can see so many different other souls we call neighbors at different stages of intellectual and spiritual development. Ephesians 1.14, which is, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his of his glory so this is a this is actually some vernacular that that's that's harking back to the concept of the kinsman redeemer the kinsman redeemer was the one it doesn't matter what you get what you were guilty of the crime you committed it doesn't matter uh, uh, if you were guilty or innocent of anything in ancient times, the kinsman redeemer could go to the city of refuge where you had taken up, where you had hidden. You had made it to the city of refuge to escape whatever judgment was coming, coming your way. Uh, and the kinsman redeemer could show up and pay a price and you could walk out of that city not suffering the consequences of your actions. All right, we're going to go to the next one and I'm going to check. My chat, that's okay for you guys to see. You guys are seeing it okay now. I just want to, I just want to make sure you guys are seeing the seeing the uh, the verses as I show them. I thought I was getting okay. Thank you, Jahara, Shiva, Melanie, Nelson, Mister C, Fearless Vic. Ain't seen you in a while. Thank you. Okay, cool. We'll continue with that, and then I'll show myself. After I'm done with these these passages, good. All right, Ephesians one seventeen. Pay attention to this the sentence structure. Give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Again, this is all to be spiritual. To be this is showing you. 100%. This is showing you that everything in the biblical material is to be spiritually interpreted. This, this isn't literal. 
There was no literal crucifixion, just like there was no literal raising Lazarus of the dead. There was no literal turning five, uh, feeding 5,000 people with, uh, uh, um, what was it? I can't even remember. Five fish and two loaves of bread. None of that. None of that is literal. There are spiritual applications to every one of these stories. There is no way. There is no way in a spiritual medium, this construct is in a spiritual medium. This is this is why we can magnify things. We can magnify particulates uh, to a certain you know magnification, and we can see that there's a lot less there than is actually there. And that there's that when you magnify matter, anything, even iron. If you magnify iron, you will find that once you magnify it to a certain area, there's going to be vast spaces between the parts that we think are actual physical iron vast spaces between them then you magnify those vast spaces and you and you find one particulate that you think is, is iron and you magnify it and it becomes an oscillating field there's nothing there this entire construct is some hyperdimensional spiritual technology that we're never going to be able to comprehend from inside the construct. That's why I just call it a construct. And it's easy to call it a simulation, even though we're actually living in an extension of the Godhead. But you know what? We can't talk like that if we want a lot of people in the world to take us seriously. So simulate, it doesn't even matter. You call it construct, it offends people. You call it simulation, it offends people. You call it an extension of the Godhead, the oversoul, a piece of the, the spiritual fabric of, of God himself. It doesn't even matter. No matter how you describe it, there's always going to be people who take offense. Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Again, this is basically telling you everything is by spiritual interpretation. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Your actual physical eyes can understand nothing. They're just organs that help you process information. So, yeah, it's spiritual application here. And what is the exceeding greatness of this power to usward who believe? Again, to he who overcometh, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. You can't get to that point without the faith, without the belief. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Here it is, an absolute admission that this construct is not the world we belong in. Here it is. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Listen, here, here's a deep statement. It's basically telling you that it was God's mercy that put you in the position of being he that overcometh. It wasn't anything you did. It was God's mercy. Mercy. It was he quickened you so that you could understand that you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. This is, you are a project of the oversoul. You are. Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Yeah. Two things to take away here. Here's an admission of artificial intelligence X, which masks around as Yahweh, Yaldabaoth, Ahriman, the Demiurge, whatever, Satan, adversary. That's one takeaway from this passage. The other takeaway from this passage that is that the oversoul in this pa passage is even communicating to the wicked that they are still considered his children. Pay attention to what you're reading here. There is no casting away of the evil, casting away of, of, of those uh, who, who are subpar spiritually. To he who overcometh are the children of light. But there's no inference here that God's not still working with the children of disobedience. Still calling them children, not calling them outcasts, not banishing them, not throwing them into a pit of eternal fire. They're the children of disobedience, which means there may come a time going through the construct, living through life sims, where children of disobedience actually become he who overcometh. 
even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together. Again, same, same, same message. And hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places. This is almost past tense, guys. We're looking at a situation of an admission that in that in the collective, we've already done this before. We may be who we are now because we already overcame in a prior construct. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ or through Christ Jesus. Christ means anointed one. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. Yeah, this is heavily inferring, heavily inferring that the whole concept of being saved isn't totally on you. That you are a project. Yeah, this is a, this is, there's a lot of deeper meanings in this. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. There it is, guys. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. Moving right along. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. This is talking about people in the past. That at, the ta- that, at that time, you were without Christ. You, you were without the anointing. Pay attention here, guys. Biblical corruptions have introduced and, term, and turned, and basically created a personage after, out of what was the teaching. That at, that at that time you were without anointing, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. What is the, co- what is the commonwealth of Israel? The book of Revelation calls the world Egypt and wicked. And in the story of, of the construct, a group of people made their exodus out of Egypt, and they became a commonwealth. That commonwealth of tribes began migrating to all distant distant parts and became a commonwealth of nations, later to emerge as empires. This is telling, this is basically saying that, that in times past, we were separated from that family that made their exodus. But now, by the grace of God, through the anointing, we have been we are going to be participants of that exodus from Egypt. That's the, that's the point of the book of Revelation. Now, for he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Pay attention to what's saying here. In the spirit world, there is no difference between any of us that are here. Only from the materialist mindset do we see racial differences, cultural differences, national differences, doctrinal differences, you know, theological. All these, all, all these, all this divisiveness only belongs to the construct. Those of us flowing through the construct, there is no separation. We are being forged into one body, a family. Remember, we're being adopted. For through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the Father, the Oversoul. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. The reason I'm, I'm stressing these in the, in, the, in the book of Ephesians is because some of you have noticed, I, I answer a lot of my comments in the comment sections. But when I get those people that are heavily focused on race, try, trying to associate a certain race with being the house of Israel and all that, we do have historical migrations. We do have historical peoples and countries, but that is still a part of the construct. It has nothing to do with what is being spiritually conveyed. 
any attachments to culture, nation, and race are all darkly associated to construct uh, ideology. And I, I try to distance myself from that. This is, this is all spiritual. The commonwealth of Israel has absorbed the sons of adoption. These are teachings in the scriptures. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus anointed himself being the chief cornerstone. Each soul of man is given a white robe. The white robe has a new name. And they're given a white stone. The white stone has their name on it. It is incorporated into the book of life, this great pyramid. When the monument of man full of souls of the redeemed is finished, the chief cornerstone will descend to initiate Exodus. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. The great pyramid in the book of Isaiah chapter 19 is called the altar in the land, midst of the land of Egypt at the border thereof. The word Giza comes from the word the stock of a tree. And it is a it was a pillar, stock of a tree, which were always set at the border to somebody's property. This is what we find with Jacob's pillar and Abraham's pillar. Anytime there was a border dispute, the those who were in dispute erected a pillar at the border. This is the message in, in many times found in scripture. So the great pyramid served as a pillar, a pillar of heaven. It was called the pillar of Enoch. But uh, in whom all the building fitly framed together. This is described just like the shepherd of Hermas text. Each, each white stone was a soul of man that is, is specifically says fitly framed together, all together into this huge monument that was being built by archangels. Yeah, it's in the shepherd of Hermas. In whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God. To he who over overcometh. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and give him a white stone and a white robe, a new avatar. That avatar is distinctly associated with being an extension of the Godhead, a small family that has overcome, that is known by all in the creation. Their identities are known. It is known that they went through whatever they went through to become that status which in all other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Christian Mysteries. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of this promise. This right here, a statement like this, pisses off the Jews. They get pissed. Yeah, because you're goyim. Yeah, you're goyim. Yeah, they, they think when they go to heaven, it's all going to be Jewish up there. So this uh this right here this is not this isn't like an anti-Jewish statement. It's, it's completely against the whole idea of 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 uh, the basically the Jewish concept on God that the Gentiles should be their fellow heirs. This this is describing spiritual adoption, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith in him. We're going to get into that. That's where this is leading. Let's see. To be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's where, I'm, that's where we're going with this. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we think, we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. We're, being, we're given the business. The book of Ephesians right now is giving us the business. We are the last days, basically night errants. And it's given us the business that you already were selected for great works. You're in the last days. I've opened up your eyes to, to separate fact from fiction, to know who the liars are, the charlatans. And you did that. I just need you to go back to your first love which was God, which was do unto others as 
as I would have you do unto, you know, you do unto yourself. The golden rule. That was the first love. All doctrinal and all self-improvement comes later. This is what this is what the scriptures are saying about, about the last day's generation of to he who overcometh. According to the power that worketh in us. We're being given the business about how powerful we are and not to worry about the seven seals, what's going on. Remember what that you got to stick it with the you got to stick it where it belongs in the continuity of the message. The the letters to the seven churches beginning with Ephesus was leading to the opening of the seven seals, which are signs for the to he who overcometh to pay attention to to understand the sign the basically uh, where they were in the divine chronology. When he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. All right, we're about to talk about these gifts. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? This is not a this is not even uh this isn't even a mystery to me. It's not a mystery mystery to me to me at all. I believe there's a vast underworld and that it is occupied and that in the material and in the spiritual, this, this right here is absolutely true. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Till we all come into the unity of the faith. Here, this is what it's all about. Spiritual interpretation of these passages shows that none of these things that are worldly apply. Church denominations, even church doctrines, race, creed, eth you know, ethnicity, culture, nation, none of, that, none of it obtains. None of it. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slay of hand and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Oh my God, what did I just hear? I heard Galactic Federation. I heard Republicans and Democrats. I just heard uh, 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 ancient aliens. Yeah, that's what I just heard right here. Yeah, yeah don't buy into none of that. From whom the whole body fitly joined together, just like stones, and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. That that right there, that grammar, well not excuse me, grammar, but that word choice proves that these scriptures are talking about the building of a structure and that each stone is a soul of man. It used the word joint. This is the same thing we find in the shepherd of Hermas about the joints all tightly fit, fitted together. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Hey, let's talk about ancient aliens, guys, right there in the Bible. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Man, I can name a whole bunch of people and channels for that one. And that ye put on the new man, which, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Listen, that ye can put on the new man in first that you can also still be the old one. I really wrestled with this when I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I first saw this passage. And I realized, wait a minute. Because we have access to the gifts of the Spirit doesn't mean we can use them all the time. They're not, they're not used all the time. There has to be an intent. So it says that you can put on the new man. Well, the new man comes with right, spiritual rights, privileges, and immunities that the rest of humans don't have. This goes back to what I'm telling you, our soul. I use the physics, I use the physics term informed field, which I, which I learned from science texts. But it's the same thing. It's our soul. It's our. It's the immortal. It's the immortal part of our personality. This informed field that has every single piece of data that we have ever come into contact with since we've been in the construct. It's in the field. This is why animals react to us the way we do. This is why other people react to us the way we do. Your informed field is as powerful as the basically your experiences have allowed it to be. 
everything you believe, everything you disbelieve, every every conversation you've ever had in a holographic field, information is never lost. It's never lost. It's all there, just waiting to be reached out there, grabbed, absorbed, you know, reprocessed, and redisseminated. This is our spirit. Put on the new man. We haven't yet become the new man. We haven't. We haven't received our white stone or our divine. We haven't. However, in the law of the spirit, we are able to borrow from who we intend to be as opposed to who we have always been. The spirit is timeless. We are going to receive powers of acuity, powers of mnemonic enhancement, powers of instant recall, powers of, of shielding and protection, the ability to actually forge events in the present by will alone. Because we've done it. We've all done it to different varying degrees. And we've shocked ourselves. And then we forget about it. I know 26 years in prison, I would have never survived had I not tapped into that spirit. Had I not played David and, and defeated my Goliaths multiple times. Had I not shocked people with a ferocity that I know I did not, I, I didn't, I didn't have. And yet, and yet there were many times in prison where my back was against the wall and I just realized, okay, I'm about to do this. And I just put fear away as if it didn't exist. And I just entered a conflict and I was just, I was just so at peace, even when other people thought I was a ferocious demon. And it, these, these things happen to us and we, we are borrowing, we are borrowing from spirit that which we haven't even attained yet. Put on the new man, which after God has created righteousness and true holiness. I, I'm, I'm about to show you. This is what this, that's where we're leading to. I'm about to show you. You may not think you have access to divine abilities, to divine rights, to divine uh, perceptions. You may not think that you have the ability to modify your present by any activity that can even extend into modifications of the past. You may not. But you do. And it's all in scripture. It's all here. Everybody has this power because we're all children. We're all sons and daughters of the adoption. But it's up to the individual to actually tap into that. We're going to get to it. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. There it is. Once you're awake, you do not go back to sleep. You are sealed. Remember, this is all going up to the seven seals. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing. You guys, you guys putting out that misinformation? Better watch out. Ephesians 5.16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Remember, I, I've showed you a lot of I showed you a lot on my channel. Scripture does not talk about years. It does not talk about it. it's the days of Noah, the days of Abraham, the days of Jacob, in the in the days of, of uh, in the days of, of Israel's sojourn in Egypt, in the days of our fathers, in the last days as in the days of Noah. Remember, all the earliest calendrical systems were all day count systems. All the Hindu, all the Sumerian, the Akkadian, all especially the Mayan, the Olmec, the Quisha, the Zapote, they're all day count systems. And remember, Genesis defines the very first timekeeping method as in the evening and the morning was the first day. In the evening and the morning was the second day. The darkness always comes before the dawn. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's not your might. It's not your might. That's why there's nothing to fear. It's his power. And you can tap into it. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Artificial intelligence X, Ahriman, uh, Yaldabaoth, 
Uh, it doesn't matter what you call him. It doesn't even matter what the adversary, y- y- definitely Yahweh, El Shaddai, that's the, 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 uh, the demon out of the burning bush. It doesn't matter what, what avatar you accept for this, this, this devil, whatever. It doesn't even matter. Put on the whole armor of God, and you're able to withstand all that. Yeah. You're not, you're not, you're not hearing this from some 27-year-old, uh, smooth, smooth-skinned, tie-wearing uh, kid who just got out of seminary in Dallas and is trying to feed you a bunch of crap that he's never listened and he's never r- truly believed or practiced in his life. Yeah, seminaries, seminaries are, are they're, the, they're the new synagogues, but you're not hearing it from that kid. You're hearing it from somebody who has walked through the dungeons of Texas prisons. Anybody can verify my history. Maximum security, more than 50% of the time I was there. Close custody, medium custody. I've, I've got 13 major cases. I picked up another prison sentence while I was serving time in prison. I'm not proud of all that, but that's what happened. That's who I was. You're talking to somebody who shouldn't even have all his teeth shouldn't even be alive. And yet I am. Because over and over in my sojourn through the dungeons of Texas, I knew I wasn't alone. All those years, I knew that there was something in me that would well up in indignation when I saw certain activities, when I came into contact with certain personalities. And sometimes I just called on God just to give me that Samson power. And man, I got a reputation. I've got guys that I know from Texas prison that are out here now. They're living their lives. They've got families, and they all remember. I was I, I was an anomaly. I'm the guy that was always quiet reading books, and then something would set me off, and I'd be in the corner fighting somebody like we were demons straight out of the 13th hell. This is what I did. This is how I was back then. Things would morally offend me, and I would just that rage would come up with me, and I and I would just jam people up. Say, man, who do you think you are, man? And then I let them say something smart, and they hit me in the mouth, and then I would just unleash on them. And I just felt that I had this spiritual, I had this divine immortality that would raise up into me. I did not care about my body. I didn't care about this avatar. Care about nothing. I didn't care about the damage people would put on my face. I didn't none of that. All I cared about was this person was a demon. They had to be subdued and I was going to do it or I would fail God. And that's, that was my attitude. And I did it. 26 years in 42 days. I got out in 2016. Got out in 2016 to a whole new world I didn't understand. Because I went to prison at 17 years old in the year 1990. Didn't understand anything about this world. I had to teach myself everything. Everything. But I've only been out of prison seven years, and I'm already exactly where I want to be in life. I did it. But I only did it because I know that I'm walking in the footsteps of something that has basically predetermined my steps. And I also know that there's absolutely no difference between me and you. None. There's none at all. Actually, you probably can accurately pronounce words better than I can. You got you got an edge up on me. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now listen to me. I, this reminds me. Oh, uh, wow! It just took me back with a memory. Oh. Uh, I was, on a, I was on a terror unit, Livingston, Texas. They used to call it the Terror Dome. Uh, Maury Povich came and did interviews with people because that unit had more murders and killings than any other unit in the system in 1996, 1997. And uh, I, re- I remember I was on a wreck yard when all kinds of stuff went on, and there was no way to tell who, what was going on. When I look around, I see some white guys fighting some Hispanic guys, and I see black guys over there fighting other black guys, and I see some Hispanic guys fighting each other. I'm like, man, what? The, it just happened so fast. I don't remember. Oh, uh, I mean, later on, I found out what, what, what had happened, but uh, um, it was really stupid. It was a black dude mistook a white guy for being Hispanic, and that's how those that group of white guys got involved. 
And but it was actually a Mexican on black issue on the rec yard. And then the white guys got suckered into it because of mistaken identity. And I just don't I just in the in the moment it happened so fast. I was playing handball. I was playing handball, huge concrete wall. I'm playing handball, and all of a sudden it just erupts. And I look over here, it erupts. I hear noises behind me, it erupts. And then I was like, normally I'm an observer. I just like, man, what the hell? Everybody just acting crazy all of a sudden. I didn't even see any of this coming. So I just remember that this verse, I don't know if it was this verse. I don't have that type of memory. I can't remember, but I do remember uh, either that incident or another one. It was it was my it was my habit that uh Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And I used to, I used to say that while I was fighting, while, while I was fighting guys and doing all that. I, I used to quote Bible verses, and sometimes it freaked people out. But I was dead serious about it. You know, uh, yeah. I, just reading this verse reminded me of that. That was one of one of the things I had done in prison. I used, to, I used to out loud quote Bible verses, empowering Bible verses, as I was getting on somebody's ass. It's crazy, man. That's so long ago. Let's see. But I, I'm going to read that one again. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the spirit, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There it is, guys. Artificial in X. AIX's programming protocols to make this world seem more real. Introduced all this stuff. We don't wrestle against anything real, guys. Nothing's real. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Yeah, it's not talking about just surviving in the conflict. It's talking about living on way past it. Whole armor of God. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Yeah, that's important right there. Loin, the loins go with the truth? Yeah. If you know you're in the right, you're going to fight 10 times harder than somebody who knows they're in the wrong and they're still trying to, to oppress you. Yeah. Yeah, the con yeah, even evil people are pricked with consciousness. The con they just suppress it really good. But uh, I've I, I have personally experienced situations where... I felt empty, scraped out, and hollow, no energy whatsoever, and I was in the wrong. I was I was morally offended by my own behavior, and I was in the wrong, and it sapped me of all my initiative. It sapped me of all my strength. Yeah, man, this is so real right here. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's that's good too. Everywhere, every your feet, everywhere you go, every coordinate. That, that, that you adopt in your sojourn through the construct, you should be all about peace. Remember, there's, there's another passage that's really good. It says, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. That's in the book of Proverbs. But yeah, I agree with that too. Because as long as you're doing that, when the trouble comes, that's when you can get that spiritual empowerment because you're in the right. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. These aren't literal fiery darts. I'm pretty sure even those who graduate seminaries would agree to that. It's not to be taken literally. These are all, all the deceitful informations, all the machinations, all the traps that have been laid for you. Yeah, it's crazy. All the traps that have been laid for you. I can show you guys a trap. Uh, I'll do it later. Let's see. <clears throat> and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There it is. Sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, is the word of God only in the Bible? I don't think so. I think the word of God can manifest in the spiritual people. There are many things that people who have never read the Bible would say that are very spiritual. And because that person is, is tapped into source, if, if it's really profound and spiritual and it affects you that way and you can feed off of it, grow, mature, and utilize what they said, then that becomes the word of God as well. There's no doubt. No doubt whatsoever. 
and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's what I'm doing right now. And what's crazy about it is the majority of Christians out there that come to my channel don't even think I'm a Christian. Because I refused to take the spiritual food and apply a literal interpretation that, that causes me to adopt the paradigm of a human sacrifice, of torture, the crucifixion, having anything to do with cleansing my immortal soul. I'm offended by that concept because the whole crucifixion deal was introduced later. It is the, it is the old crucified gods concept. Yeah, way before Jesus, there were a lot of crucified gods. There's a lot. Not buying into it. For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Guys, he just gave you the business. Apollyon just told, not, well, Apollonius just told you right here. For which I am an ambassador in bonds. He's in an avatar. Paul just admitted he's an avatar, an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The materialist interpretation will say, oh, he must have been in jail when he wrote this. No, I am an ambassador in bonds. He recognizes this ain't my real self. This belongs to the construct. I can speak boldly here because the only consequences are affecting the avatar. The avatar doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the construct. Why? Because Paul understood he's a part of the family of God for which the symbol of the Great Pyramid embodies. Yeah, guys. Was that my last slide? I believe it was. I think that was my last slide, guys. I'm going to check just to make sure. Yep, that was it. It's the last of those slides. Let me quit sharing my screen. All right, I'm back. Hope I didn't have any interruptions in my in my chat feed. Now, <clears throat> so <clears throat> this message here, well, I got something I need to remove here. All right. So <clears throat> the whole armor of God is just metaphor. It's just metaphor. There's no sword of the spirit. There's no helm of, of, of salvation. Yeah, there's nothing to put around. There's no there's no breastplate of righteousness. You know, the, the boots of the gospel of peace. These are metaphors. These are not to be taken literally at all. But this is exactly what we need to do. Because sometimes, like Jesus gave us parables, sometimes we need to attach mundane ideas in order to process things that are spiritual. That's what a, that's what a parable is. It's exactly what a parable is. So my, my point here about being the Ephesian knight, the concept conveyed in what I showed you about Ephesus in... The, the, the church of Ephesus in the book of Revelation, which is given these revelations right before the breaking of the seals and what we found only in the book of Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. The concept being conveyed here is that in the last days, you need to be the Ephesian knight. The Ephesian knight does not fight with real armor, doesn't have real weapons of anything of the world. The Ephesian knight has completely adopted the stance that this war that's going to be fought in the last days is 100% entirely spiritual. And because it is spiritual, it allows the Ephesian knight to move forward and borrow the protections, borrow the power, borrow the memory, borrow everything the Ephesian knight needs to navigate to the Exodus point. Everything needed to get to that Exodus point, that point of Exodus from the construct, will be provided to the Ephesian knight if the Ephesian knight just simply moves forward. You are already predestined for that position. You have already been adopted into the family of God, called in the world the Commonwealth of Israel. You have already been given the rights, privileges, and immunities. 
but they that that avatar has not been accepted yet. You got you have to make your exodus from the construct to wear that avatar. However, the, the in the realm of the spirit, you can still reach forward and use some of those spiritual powers and abilities. Maybe it's because there's really no such thing as time. I don't know. But the message of the Spirit is that even, even the rights, privilege, and powers and immunities that are granted to you when you receive your new white raiment are already accessible to you now in some form. I know for a fact they are because I've lived it. Remember, I'm not going to get into all the faith healing and all that, but remember, we have to call those things that be not as if they are. Just like Jesus spoke in fictions called parables, which are images of truth. The Ephesian knight needs to move forward already understanding that there's nothing in the world to fear because you're wearing spiritual armor. There's nothing in the world, there's nothing in the world to be suspicious of because I've already given you the truth. There is nothing in the there is nothing in the world that you can build because you're moving toward toward an egress point, an exodus. There's nothing for you here. Anyone who has now adopted adopted the paradigm of the Ephesian night understands that this is it. This is my last rodeo here. I am already awake. I no longer belong. I don't feel I belong here. There's nothing for me here whatsoever. And I am perfectly willing to move forward and into my new family. Sons and daughters of adoption has nothing to do with bloodline. Anybody, anybody still fixed on that bloodline uh, and blood relation deals is still entertaining the dictates of the construct. That's what they have chosen this round. When, when the exodus point is made, they're not going to participate in that part. They're going to get recycled and rebooted back, back to Genesis to do all this over again. That's who they are. But the Ephesian knight has literally been told in the book of Eph in the Revelation and in the book of Ephesus that there's nothing to fear whatsoever in the end times for those who have been predestined to be a part of the family of God. There's no there's nothing to fear. Everything has already been provided. You didn't earn it. You didn't earn that's the whole message. You did not earn this status. It was given to you by the grace of God. If you are awake in these times, it's because you were awakened for a reason. That's my point of this video. That's my point of this video. I don't want it to go on too long. It's already been two hours and 15 minutes. But be the Ephesian knight. Be the individual who doesn't have to strive and worry about navigating through these future events. Because the Ephesian knight's steps are already guided. You're going to navigate right through these events just fine. I've told you, I've told you guys, we're, we're on, we're in the seals. We're in, more than you know, more than I've even conveyed to you on my channel. I have already come into contact with more and more data that shows me 100% the first seal was broken in 2020. The next seal will be broken this year. I've got way more data on this. We're going to get into it, but there's nothing for the Ephesian night to fear. The Ephesian knight is, in essence, the knight errant. Hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. But that's what it's about, man. No, it's about no fear. There's nothing to fear at all. And with that, I love you guys.